Hearth and pine, pine and hearth. This is our song. Now we're going to start. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Hearth and Pine. I'm Tyrone Dayhawk Nighthammock. And I'm Mac. In the last episode, we talked a lot about survival equipment and bug out bags. This week, we're going to talk about something that people don't talk about a whole lot when they're enjoying the outdoors, and that would be weather and how it affects your plans. A lot of people seem to think that weather is considered to be small talk when really it's not. Weather is important to every single activity we do on the daily, whether it's climate change, (laughs) politics and climate change, whether the ice is going to freeze over the road this morning, or if there's a bomb cyclone on the way that's going to knock out a block of power lines. Weather affects everything, every day. And the only way that we can be prepared when going outdoors is to keep an eye on the weather and to be able to analyze weather patterns from the past few weeks and the upcoming days to decide whether or not a certain hike is going to be good for a certain day or if it should be held off for another day. So, Tyrone, Before you met me, how did you typically plan your hikes? Basically, back then it was all about accessibility, and I didn't really branch out into hiking hard into the Cascades and other places until after I met you. It was mostly close hikes and stuff that was easily accessible via my little teeny car. Most forest roads were not areas that I wanted to take that thing until recently, since all of the warranties are now expired. So doesn't matter anymore. But did you have a like a radius of hikes that you stuck to? Or was it whatever was literally super close by and what your car could get to? Uh, it was anything within about 20 miles. And mostly back then, it was more of a lot of mountain biking and a lot less hiking. Unless I had to get up a hill. Then there was no biking. There was hiking. (laughs) I really didn't take into account things like weather during that day or even previous weather patterns that had been taking place. It was, hey, it's good enough. Let's ride. And the only thing that really affected me weather-wise was if it was really rainy and muddy, I didn't go because I didn't want to tear up the trails. So you'd turn around? Uh, basically, yeah, I'd turn around and ride the roads, but... Oh, so, but you'd still, you'd still go and be active. Yeah, but I hadn't been thinking about other issues that can arise from saturation in the ground. All I was thinking about was not ruining the trail. I wasn't thinking about other issues that we do experience quite often here in the Pacific Northwest. Tyrone, I'm super curious if you have a story about a hike or a adventure that you went on that you regretted not paying attention to the weather for. Yeah, and it was, uh, believe it or not, it was kind of an opposite of what you'd expect. Where, you know, out here in the Northwest, you look at, oh, it's raining, oh, it's ice storms, snowstorms, all that. Especially hiking into the mountains, those snowstorms can come in quick. And so one of my buddies, who's this rock climber, snowboarder, all this asked me to go on a hike up to this place called Point Butte. And I am vertically challenged. I hate heights like there's no tomorrow. That is the most terrifying thing to me in the world. So, of course, everybody takes me hiking into the mountains on all sorts of super scary trails and push me to my limits and beyond my limits. So we get up to the bottom of the trail. you got to crack out early for this. Most of these bigger hikes, if you want to get a good start, you got to leave here at like 4 a.m., get up into the mountains and get going. And it's beautiful. The whole hike in, we're down through these meadows, and then we start to slowly rise up. Now, that's not bad. This whole trail so far has been great. It's been in wide open Uh, Even the climbing area is wide areas. You're not going near any cliffs or anything, which is awesome. Oh, we start getting into higher altitude, and so then all of a sudden we're getting into snow, which is fine. Growing up in the Midwest, snow is nothing new to me. 
However, I started seeing pink snow. This is a sign of climate change as you start to see more and more pink snow in these areas. Apparently it was originally discovered in like the 1800s and they thought it was like the coolest thing in the world, but it's actually a very bad sign of things that are going on. And I can't remember exactly where it comes from. It doesn't taste like cotton candy. Um, don't eat it. It's not good for you. So we start getting up higher into the snow. And again, still wide open areas. The closest edge is a good 500 yards away, which is far enough where I can't see it. So it's not a problem. Then my buddy points out where we're going. Now, throughout the Cascades, there are these wonderful lookout towers that are somehow in the most terrifying places possible. They build these little huts on the very tippy peak of giant mountains. But you can go up to them. You can stay the night if you want. Uh, you can go up them like I do and have a complete meltdown because you're scared out of your mind. Anyways, we're on our way up to this lookout tower. It's going to get great views, going to be beautiful. And we come around a corner as the trail winds through these hills. And it takes a turn onto a pretty steep hillside. Now, all day it has been beautiful. We're in t-shirts. It's nice and warm out. Did not click in my head that all the snow on that hillside had turned to ice. Now, unfortunately, I didn't have spikes, I didn't have poles, and at the bottom of the hill, which was a good, I'd say, 200-foot icy slide, was a cliff that looked to be a good 300 feet down. So it was 200 feet of ice sloped and then a cliff beyond that? Yes. Okay. That would have been about a 300-foot drop. Okay. Into a valley or a rock rock valley or... The few times I looked in that direction, it looked like a rocky death hole valley ah. from hell. So like an avalanche chute, maybe? Yeah, probably. So the trail, because it's a, a lookout tower, it's a popular spot. There'd already been people coming through. Unfortunately, their footprints were hardened as well, and they did not do a good job of walking correctly, digging the heels in, making a trail, making something that's going to firm up and be a good spot for other people. It was a very slippery walk. In these instances, one of the things you can try and do is walk in the fresher snow and make your own trail. Unfortunately, again, the sun was out, that hillside was thick ice, and try as you might, you couldn't stomp through. So we did our best. My buddy... Again, rock climber, snowboarder, no fear, just way up ahead of me as I am pretty much almost hands and knees crawling because I am so afraid of sliding down that hill and then just plummeting off that cliff. But I made it, got up, had our victory beers at the tower. While we were there, a Coast Guard helicopter came in and they were doing touch and go landing drills where they would land and take off and land and take off. And that made me even more worried because they were landing in an area that was below where we were. I'm the type of person who believes when you're on a hike, you should not be hiking above flying vehicles. That's just asinine. So then on the way back, you know, the day had continued on. The hike back down that icy slope was worse. Going down for me is always less fun than going up because then I actually have to look down. But also my knees, they don't like it. So with the downward slope facing forward, as well as the downward side angle, it was terrifying. And after we rounded that last corner, wide open fields again, it was great. And we actually ran into a few other people on our way down and we'd given them some advice about how icy it was and might not be the best, especially a couple groups that had some very wily dogs. So we got back to the parking lot. We're having another victory beer. And the group with the wily dog showed up pretty quickly. And so we stopped to ask them if they made it. And they said as soon as they rounded that corner, one of their dogs started running around. 
and as it started running around, it got into the icy slopes. But thankfully, it was on a leash, and they were able to pull it back, and that's when they decided, nope, we're not making it to the tower. Leash your dogs, folks. Always, 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 always. Well, they were lucky, too, because the dogs were off-leash when we had told them it's icy up ahead. You might want to keep that in mind, and I think shortly after that is when they leashed them. That would have been a bad day. Yeah, it really would have. But that was one of those things. Like, I would have never thought about it. Hey, it's sunny. It's gorgeous. Would have never clicked in my head. It's going to be icy, and you don't have spikes, which I do now, and I also have poles, because I don't play those games no more. How long was the uh, length of time between this hike and you buying your spikes? Mm, That day, or the day after that hike, I got home and immediately started looking online (laughs) and then decided to just go. And I think it was a week later, I went to the sporting goods store and just bought a cheap pair. I was like, anything's good as long as it works or, you know, it's better than nothing. But. To give you an idea of how slow I moved through that area, that was a, that section trail was probably 300 yards and should have taken 20, maybe 30 minutes. And it took me about 45 minutes to an hour because of how slow I was moving because I was terrified, but also I could tell my boots were not biting into anything at all. And one bad move and the way I would have gone. You do move really slow, though, when when it's even remotely icy out. Like, you go very slow. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I do, I do. That was my fun tale of weather ruining my hike. Mac, you got one? Well, after um, a number of minutes trying to figure out what possible story I could tell, we have come to the conclusion that I am just... Too prepared, I, apparently. I am on top of my game. <laughs> I have had minor bad experiences when I've gone on my hikes. I'm I'm a late riser, and so I am in a bad habit of getting to hikes much later than is recommended. So I've hiked back to my car in the dark with other people. Um, there was one instance where... It was so hot the day before that we did not have enough water to finish the hike that we were currently on. So I've been unprepared in in ways other than weather, other than non-weather related instances. I have always been pretty on top of my, my planning. Part of that might be because my mom was always really paranoid of me randomly dying in a freak accident. And she passed on her paranoia to me, but (laughs) I pay attention to a lot of things and I try to take a lot of things into account when I'm planning, which makes me an awesome hiking partner, even though it can be frustrating, but (laughs) I make sure that we're safe. Being that I'm not the type of person who's good at checking the weather, staying on the trail, or any of that kind of stuff... Mac, why don't you tell these folks how you interpret the weather and use it to plan your hikes and adventures? I can do that. (laughs) Do you think maybe they'll learn a little bit? Not saying that you guys are unknowledgeable, but there are just some people that don't think about things. Even if they don't learn, it's not our fault. We can (laughs) say we tried. (laughs) I don't sit down and plan out my hikes like some people do. Like, I'm fairly spontaneous, but I do like to avoid certain hikes when I know that something in particular has happened in that region recently. So, for an example, let's say that it's the end of spring, either April or May, and you're in the Pacific Northwest You just got done experiencing three weeks of rain and fog, no sun in between, and let's say a bomb cyclone every weekend for the past three weeks. 
What is a bomb cyclone? First off, bomb cyclone, it's hurricane force winds that drops in air pressure, which results in a winter hurricane. So it's not exactly a hurricane, but it's got a lot of the same aspects. It's the West Coast's version of a hurricane, I suppose. The predecessor to a bomb cyclone are gale storms, which we get almost daily during winter now. So three weeks, rain and fog every day, three bomb cyclones. What is happening up in the mountains while all of this is happening down on the coast? Snow. Lots and lots and lots of snow. So if the fog ends up overlapping the cold front and pushing the rain down more, creating more fog, that means that there is a gap in the stratosphere from where our fog is, the rain clouds are, and where the rain shadow exists on the mountain range. When the next week comes and you have five forecasted days of sunny or partly sunny, the one thing you know is going to happen for sure is that snow is going to melt in the mountains because of the rain shadow. Any bad weather that's happening in eastern Washington is going to stay in eastern Washington. Any good weather that's on this side is going to stay on this side. If it's still foggy, the sun is going to reflect off of the fog and the heat trapped between those layers will melt the snow even faster. Now, that doesn't mean that all of the snow is going to melt at the same time. That's not how snow works. What it does mean is that the top layer of snow can either become a sheet of ice or it can melt down to the subnivian zone. The subnivian zone is sort of like a pocket of warm air between the ground and... Um, it's kind of, This is kind of hard to explain, so I'll put up a visual here, and then you can see the subnivian layer. So all of the water that melts from the sunlight goes down to the subnivian layer. It creates snow melt that runs either underground to the groundwater levels, or it creates canals in the subnivian level. And you can, you can see areas where canals like that exist. Above glacial lakes, you'll see the areas where water most commonly comes down the mountain. There is an actual word for that, but I'm not, like, a pro at any of this. <laughs> so just bear with me. So as the snow starts melting and the groundwater starts collecting, the rivers start to get inundated with all of that snow melt. Keep in mind that the snow melt is adding on to the three weeks of rainwater that we just got. So if that three weeks of rainwater accumulated 14 inches of freshwater rain, that means the rivers have raised in height by a couple inches. It won't be the exact 14 inches because aquifers and marshes will be collect and detention ponds will be collecting that rainwater. But the river levels will rise, subsurface water flow will increase, and what this means is you get an increase in, so the subsurface flow of water under rocks, trees, pavement, the water that drains into culverts, and the water that flows into rivers will be increased by a good amount. When too much water flows too quickly for too often underneath rock, it displaces the we'll call it structural loading of the rocks underneath that first layer. When that structural load holding the topmost level of rock and ground becomes unstable and starts shifting and, and shaking a little bit with the amount of water runoff it's receiving, that's how landslides happen. So we've covered water runoff, right? And I, I, I'm hoping that I'm explaining this well enough that you can picture what I'm saying. So water takes away the stability of rocks. Water takes away the stability of root systems. Water inundates rivers, which increases the force of movement in a river, which destabilizes rocks even more. So now add in the three bomb cyclones we just used in our example. Bomb cyclones that have sustained winds of 35 to 65 mile per hour winds are going to knock down trees. Like without a doubt, it's going to happen. If the mountainsides that have 
just recently been inundated with an increased water level and high winds, the instability of their root system is doubled. So combine that all together. You have a mass increase of rain. You have a destabilization of soil. You have a destabilization of structural loading holding up rock faces. And last but not least, you have unstable trees that could be anywhere from 10 years old to 50 years old, depending on where you're hiking and if there's been recent logging. Your landslide threat, I'm not going to give you a percentage because, again, I'm not a scientist. But your landslide threat after those factors are taken into consideration are much, much higher than any other day. Sure, yes, after I explain all this, it totally makes sense. But are you the kind of person that would have taken three weeks of weather into account for the hike that you're going to go on tomorrow? I definitely wasn't. Right. So, like, we know that there's people like that that don't exist, that they just want to live in the moment and go when they feel like it. And that's totally okay. It (laughs) You don't have to live like everyone else. You can do whatever the fuck you want whenever you want as long as you're not hurting anyone. But it does increase your risk of injury when you don't plan ahead in terms of weather. There are other things to keep in mind when you are planning out your hikes, too, and And things like that include whether or not you're in a hurricane season, if you're in tornado season. And I I don't just mean historical tornado or hurricane seasons, because Fort Myers just had a tornado last week, and it's winter. The entire Midwest, I think 16 states, were inundated with tornadoes in winter. That is completely unheard of. So... Being aware of the weather is becoming massively important, especially if you're still wanting to go out and enjoy life. You don't want to have to deal with surprise snowstorms or like in Colorado, there's flash floods that can happen at any moment if you're up in the mountains. And those are fucking scary. I tell you, if you haven't seen the YouTube videos of people going up Bear Creek Falls, it's it's called something like that. You should look it up. It's crazy watching the flash flood happen. Ugh. Not just foul weather, but warm weather, too. There was that entire family earlier this year that they found on a short trail only, I think it was like half a mile to a mile from their car. Oh, you're talking about the couple who who died in the desert. With their dog and their kid, mm-hmm. yeah. And it's because they didn't have water and yep. they had gone out at a point in the day when it was extremely hot. Yep. And they had, they had no idea that they were as dehydrated as they were and they just passed out from heat exhaustion. Yeah. So... Like, <laughs> knowing the weather and not overestimating your abilities. Like, I I cannot stress that enough. Do not overestimate what you can or cannot do in extreme conditions. Don't be stupid. Always be safe. Yeah, error on the side of safety. Like, if you think you can do something, then error on I can only do half of that. Or you can also consider it like this. I can do this. But I can do this better if I have X, Y, and Z with me. True. So. And if it's really nasty, it's, <laughs> do I need to do this right yeah. now? It's okay to have rest days. You don't need to justify doing nothing. You can <laughs> you can do absolutely nothing on a sunny day. You don't have to feel bad about it. You're just living. Live for the sake of living. <laughs> yeah. And just because your fr- friend Bethany got pictures at the top of Mount Rainier, even though that was actually Snow Lake, and they lied to you. Remember those people that were like, is this Mount Rainier? No, oh, but I'm going to say it is. I don't remember that. Because we were on the way <laughs> down from Snow Lake. Doesn't mean you have to. You ain't got to fill your Instagram just because Bethany does. Right. Also, I don't know Bethany. So if your name is Bethany, I apologize. Poor example. <laughs> And, like, of course, there's, we could talk about volcanoes and how to deal with tsunamis, but I've never had the pleasure of experiencing a tsunami before. And I know the the things you're supposed to do, but that's not really hiking related, I think. I don't have the experience of hiking in tsunami areas. All I could say is, if you're hiking and there's a tsunami, get to high ground, obviously. Yeah, if you're from, like, the middle of Oklahoma and you don't know what to do in a tsunami, and you're listening to this, (laughs) 
and this is your first time hearing about what to do, always get to higher ground. Mm -hmm. Get off your ass and run. Yeah. Um, But don't panic. No. (laughs) Run, but don't panic. There's a huge difference. Yeah. You don't want to trample over other people and cause smaller disasters for the people around you just because you can't handle yourself in a stressful situation. Move quickly and calmly to the exits. (laughs) Just like the airline stewardess tells you. (laughs) And really just breathe and keep moving. Right. If you ever find yourself in a real fucking scary situation, there are ways to prep for it. The more, so the psychology behind it is that the more you expose yourself to a certain event, the more desensitized you become to it. And the only way we can really do that is with the internet. So if you think that a rock slide would keep you frozen in fear, I encourage you to start watching videos of people that go through rock slides so that you can figure out what it looks like, what are the warning signs, what it looks like afterwards, and how to respond to it. You know, analyze what they did wrong, analyze what they did right, and keep researching how to manage the situation. There are a broader range of tools to use, but there's um, crisis counselors are great to talk to to get an idea of how to manage yourself during high intensity moments. Another exercise you can do is go into a dark room with a strobe light and with a friend and throw rocks at each other. Oh God. I can't believe you've done this. <laughs> and put on like crazy, like hallucinogen mushroom. They make some good songs. Don't take mushrooms. The, the band is called Hallucinogen Mushroom. Okay, good clarification because yeah. we are not telling people to do drugs no, on I this was podcast. Not. <laughs> you can do that on your own accord if you're an adult and you live in a country or state where it's legal. Just stop while you're ahead. <laughs> Just... and then last but not least, I guess it'd be volcanoes, but. Yeah, I don't know how. I mean, if you haven't watched the Hunga Tonga volcano enough times yet, then <laughs> well, watch um... it more. Not only that, but the, the uh, when Mount St. Helens went off and that researcher was up there. Dante's there, Peak! There's a certain point where you're at a certain radius that you're not going to escape. So you might as well just do something great at the last moment. Say something cool. Or was Mount Vesuvius when that went off? There's that fr- guy who was frozen in ash. It looks like he's jerking off. Oh, God. You're making that up. I'm not. Look it up online. Okay. We'll share a photo if there is a photo. <laughs> Some of you probably already know him. They're like, yeah, Tyrone, I know what you're talking about. <laughs> but the guy on Mount St. Helens, he knew there was no way he could escape. And so he just was like, last I'm transmission. Bust one out. <laughs> well, no, no, that was Mount Vesuvius. The researcher on Mount St. Helens just gave his last radio transmission to his friends. And he was like, I'm out. Took a bunch of pictures, put his camera in a safe spot. And that's how they were able to actually get the film back from his wow. camera. Wow. Yeah, um, just a side note, though, like sort of maybe a trigger warning. Don't go down a rabbit hole of looking up disasters. You're going to give yourself climate anxiety or you're going to increase your paranoia of something bad happening. Just but <laughs> be conscientious of how much you consume because you need to take care of your mental health first and foremost. And be careful on, like, what you're searching, too. Like, when you're trying to find the guy uh, in Pompeii, be careful what you type in. Why? Because it could probably take you to some really bad website. That's all we got for you tonight, folks. This is Mac. And this is Tyrone. Thank you for listening to Hearth and Pine. We hope to see you next time. Bye. 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 Have a good time. Good night. Happy Saturday. Hasta luego. Stay warm. Keep your stick on the ice. Don't talk to strangers.